G'day fans, and we're back talking about Star Trek Discovery. What did Santa bring you for Christmas? He might have brought you a box of collectibles. He might have got you some Lego, but instead we got Star Trek Discovery episodes number 11, Sue Carl. How good was that? Holy guacamole. Yeah, get rid of the Christmas bags. You want a bit of Star Trek Discovery. It's Dags and MPS with you today. And, uh, and even though Christmas was there yesterday and it's all like forgotten, we've sort of moved on. MPS, what did you think of Sue Carl? Well, in terms of presents, I thought it was a bit of a mixed bag of goodies. So we will get to some of those shortly. Um, I thought, it, look, it started off great. The outside of the ship, you get into the inside. Of the ship, beautiful photography. Where and they're like everybody's just standing around. It was like, oh, okay. They're obviously got nothing to do. They're all bored out of their brains. And uh, I assume it's the wake for uh, poor old Giorgio. So uh, I thought, oh, yeah, fair enough. So clearly the, the crew aren't in a hurry to go anywhere. It's just like they're just chilling out. Uh, the thing that I found is that, uh, you got a deer and like gray has reappeared, right? And there's a big, yeah, you know, it's like, okay, well, and I thought, why? What's the point? What's the big deal? Mm. Who cares? You know, does it, you know, is, what's, what's the story with that? And Stamps turns around and says, yeah, bugger off, you know, we don't need you here anymore. And um, I, it was just, just a weird inclusion uh, of the character into the story. And some people have assumed that when a deer goes down to uh, the planet later on, that maybe Gray will actually manifest manifest himself into actually a living person or a being that others can see. So maybe that's got something to do with it. But uh, that one sort of just came out absolutely nowhere. But then after that, we nicked off to the, the planet to look at the Kelpians and the holodecks and all sorts of crazy shit going on. So uh, what do you think of all that? Mate, full on, eh? Well, look, yeah, I, I got to start with this question first. I don't understand why the... The nacelles are detached. It doesn't do anything for the ship and it doesn't do anything. And I noticed that again. And it's like, why? Why don't they just attach the damn things and just continue on? Because it's just crazy. Uh, as for Grey reappearing, I figured that had to be the case sooner or later. And now that you mentioned it, I think perhaps that uh, Grey could be their saviour later on. You know, mm -hmm. uh, this is obviously no spoilers here. This is a two-parter, which would have been nice to have known that in the beginning rather than sort of sitting there. And then all of a sudden it just goes, ah, oh, no, we're going to end this and uh, we'll discuss this next week. So, um, yeah, uh, great coming back. And that's going to mess with the deer, I think, somewhere along the line, but possibly be a help uh, once they're down there. As for the Kelpian ship, um, well, that's a bit of that's a bit of a, a head mess, isn't it? You've got <laughs> stairs going upside down and all this sort of stuff. And and one person is alive. And look, we come back to the term the child. Doesn't yeah. that sound familiar from something yeah. else? Golly. So yeah, Star Wars fan then, loving that. Yep. Yeah, and then the big floaty things that are chasing them. So, uh, yeah, not really sure. Although I did like the way that they looked, especially we'll get to it later. But when it's up against Michael, it looks like yep. to me it looks like they've they've shot it in water. Yeah. Because everything yep. flows and floats, and then it just takes off. It just looks fantastic. I look. I've got to say this episode the the visual effects are plus a plus plus sort of thing they are top of their game on this stuff um first thing i liked is the fact that uh, good old stamets actually called saru captain uh in recent episodes he's always just called him saru not to his face you know behind his back and i thought that's a little bit disrespectful son and the captain was always the captain regardless and you know if you haven't watched your, if you watch all your star trek series the captain was always the captain no matter what and he always used to call him saru but this time he actually called him captain in his face i thought oh yeah good on you for that um yeah that whole planet thing i think some people said it's like one of those escher cartoons you know with the stairwells going all yeah. sorts of crazy different directions and all the rest of it and uh, and a mind spin is exactly what it is. I'll tell you what, if you want to try and analyze what all this is about, get a bit of the old wacky tobacco, have a, and go, hey man, it's making all sense to me. Jeepers creepers, we're in the hollow deck, man. It's like, this is a dilithium thing. And yeah, absolutely weird as. And uh, I think a lot of fans are um, struggling to get their head around exactly what it's all about. And clearly it'll probably be explained as we get further along. And I agree with you that visually, yeah, the whole thing looked absolutely fantastic. And uh, actually it almost had a bit of like Lord of the Rings feel to it too, I felt, especially in some yeah. wider shots. Uh, and it was quite, um, quite cool. So um, yeah, very interesting. It's, yeah, it's, it's a tough one to sort of disseminate this whole business with um, the, the child dude, the Kelpian guy, I forgot his name. Oh, so Carl, yeah, this episode name. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what all that's about. If, if anything that was really, really groovy that came out of that is um, the fact that good old Saru, uh, Doug Jones, the actor, got to appear mm -hmm. as a human. That was very cool. 
actually you actually yeah. get to see the guy because most of the time he spends his life in makeup and now he's actually gets to appear of him as himself that was pretty groovy what do you reckon yeah i that was awesome that was the best part of of those three transforming down like i think that um michael being trill didn't really do it uh and um Hugh was Bajora. It was like no big deal. If he had have had like big Vulcan ears, that would have made something, you know, it would have been a little bit different. But to have Saru, to, I, I think it would have felt weird for Doug to sort of rock up on stage and go, um, yep. yeah, no makeup. How do I do this? You know, sort of portraying himself as Saru, but without the makeup, you know, the, the mannerisms would have felt probably a little bit weird for him, but he did a fantastic job. And I loved yep. seeing him as Doug for, for the first time in a lot of stuff. Like yep. he's never shown his face really. So, and this just proves that he is, even with the mask and makeup on, he's still a damn good actor. Yeah. So here's a question for, here's a question for you. Um, uh, when Booker had to bail out of the, of the bridge, um, the guy actually had to send him uh, on his way uh, rather than using his own personal transporter device. So did you sort of pick that up and uh, sort of figure that one out? Yeah, I kind of did because he doesn't have a Federation badge. He's not part of the Federation. You know, we've had discussions with, with uh, him and the Admiral last week, I think it was. And he said, you know, I can be that sort of, you know, black ops type of guy that can do those missions that you don't, can't officially do sort of thing. So uh, because he's not part of the Federation, doesn't have a Federation sing signature. So he just gets beamed out wherever they want, which is a bit of a hassle because then you can't beam back in as quick and do all that sort mm. of cool stuff. So yeah, I think that's, that's it. And yeah. Yeah. Nah, very, very cool. So yeah, it's kind of bizarre, isn't it? Cause everybody is so used to having people just personally transport everywhere. Suddenly to have to say to someone, Oh, can you send me on my way? Uh, you'd have to hope that they know where the destination is. It could end up uh, quite badly for you. <laughs> so the crux of the story, there's two, obviously, once again, you've got the A and B story. Um, the crux of the story is you're on the planet. We've got to find out where the burn came from, right? I mean, it turns out we've got this Kelpian kid and he was born on this this thing and in a holodeck and, oh, it's just, it's very hard to disseminate. So if anybody out there is watching and expecting us to explain it to you, <laughs> don't. Um, so uh, I think people are interpreting this thing in completely different ways, but in short, uh, the kid who's connected to the Dilithium planet thing uh, had a bit of a traumatic experience, which a lot of people have sort of worked out as being the death of uh, the mother. And it's just like kind of lost his load. And it's just like this thing's just gone out through subspace and destroyed all Dilithium. So that actually makes this dude, good old uh, Sukal, or like the greatest mass murderer in the entire galaxy. <laughs> so he's killed all these people. He's not even aware of it. So based on just what we've seen, uh, how did you find all that work? You know, the way that Michael had to interact with uh, Sukal as a like he was like the child and she was pretending to be a program and all the rest. How did you find all that? I thought that was very clever that she pre pretended to become one of the programs, uh, and then when he started getting you know frustrated with her, he sort of rescheduled the program and she changed. Uh, it took her a little bit to sort of figure it out, and um, yeah, that was very clever in terms of working out how the child did it. I have a theory, and you're right, it's not bunnies, that it might not have been the death of the mother, but it might have been the first time you saw that, that ghost spirit thing chasing him, and he might have just been so scared, because apparently, from what I can work out, it's their emotions that create how that affects you, because it wasn't until he got scared when they, he met them the first time, and the door started banging along, getting knocked and that sort of thing, when the creature came through, he took off and he was scared. So something was there. Now, obviously, he's putting those. Um, so you're putting it simply. That's his equivalent of crapping his pants, right? <laughs> yeah, this massively his pants. <laughs> massively yeah, sorry. His pants. Keep going. And and so therefore the fear, the the emotion and the energy, based on the fact that he's used to the dilithium and he's you know because he was it's all inserted because of his the way he was born and all that sort of stuff. So basically when he craps himself, things go boom. So he must have had that first scare potentially with that creature coming the first time. And as a child, that would scare you horribly. Mm. So, you know, and again, kind of like the child, yep. you know, when he gets yep. afraid, he sort of uses the force, but not in a completely controlled fashion. That's and a Star Wars child we're talking about, not the Star, Star Wars child, child, not the Star yeah, Trek child, and we're going to get confused. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I think that when he's he was terrified that first time he saw it, that's what made the dilithium explode. And I think Works that's for me. What, I've got what, nothing uh, else to go with on that one. So, uh, yeah, that one's uh, I've got them completely sold on that. So there you go. Um, a couple of things. Uh, I like the fact that they showed some uh, new Federation uniforms from 100 years ago. Kind of remind me of Space 1999, actually, with the coloured sort of sleeves and stuff. So that was actually kind of groovy. Um, and, of course, we've got this whole thing with... Um, 
Tilly now being left uh, in charge of the ship. Uh, and there's been a lot of debate as to whether that was a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, her with Michael, you know, she's obviously very, very nervous about it all and how it's all going to pan out. That was actually really, really good. But she finally gets plonked in the captain's chair, got the little knobby thing under the under the arm there and uh, having to deal with Emerald Chain and all the rest of it. And a lot of people have looked at the whole scene and said, sure, the conversation between Tilly and Osiris was fantastic, but ultimately Tilly was the wrong person for the job. She didn't put the shields up, even though the shields weren't that flash at the time. But anyway, any shields better than no shields and didn't fly away. And it just sort of all went completely down the tube. And uh, you can put that down to a massive amount of inexperience on her part. But uh, uh, how did you find uh, or how did you find all that? I, I thought Tilly was good in the first interaction with Asara. Yeah. She sort of had that, you know, threw it back at her sort of thing. I, I could see her heartbeat racing if that makes sense. You know, you could sort of see her sitting there, you know, clenched sort of hands on the chair and going, nah, I've got to, and pulling out all this stuff that, you know, reference back to her. Uh, you're right. She should have disappeared the first time after that. She should have had the ship move at least or be ready to, to go into warp or whatever the case was. Um, but the second time when they interacted, that was, and as we know, things happen in threes in film and TV, and it should have been the third interaction. So the second interaction, and they just all beam onto the ship. It's like, well, obviously, again, shields don't really work uh, nowadays with the new beaming technology. You can just turn up wherever you want. Um, and, you know, being outmanned and outgunned, they were sort of a little bit sort of screwed. Um, but, mm. uh, yeah, I, I actually thought that at one point Tilly would have maybe gone back to a mirror universe self, if you remember from, what was mm. the season one, when she... She had to pretend she was. The yeah, yeah, yeah. That that that, that lives that they had that attitude. Yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah. people have picked up that. She should have kicked into killing mode. Yeah, exactly right. Yep. Yeah, and that would have been good. And I reckon if if there had been the third attempt on that, she may have. Yep. Gone that far, but uh, yeah. Once they jump on the, on the ship, and you know, yep. everyone's now standing around with their hands up, sort of thing. I think it's uh, at this point in time a little bit over red or over. Very good. Yeah, so that whole thing with like Osara gets on the ship, and like Osara's makeup has now changed, and a few people have picked up on that, and they reckon she looks a little bit more threatening than she did like a few episodes ago, which is kind of cool. And a lot of people say, yeah, they just appeared out of nowhere. And I did like the fact that her ship just gets those big tentacle things out and grabs on Discovery, and it's like, oh, what are we going to do now? Moment. Some people have been a bit critical of it and said, oh, look, the crew just stood around and did nothing. Like there was actually not even any attempt to fight back whatsoever. They just said, oh, yeah, we give up. And uh, it was a little bit disappointing. But I guess. If you're using 32nd century uh, tactics, which is like we will just beam directly into where we've got to get to, you mean, there's no defence against that whatsoever. Mm. And, of course, that brings up this massive amount of information, this, this huge question that a lot of people have been mulling over, is how did Osiris know everything that was going on, not just where Discovery was, but where everything was within the ship? Now, mm. they use the excuse in the, in the, in the show, she says, oh, you can track their spore drive, jump, like, Duvalakas, you know, they've got an idea. There's tracking devices, whatever. But there's a lot of discussion as to whether there's a spy uh, within the ranks of the entire thing. Because when those guys appeared in the engine bay with a spore drive, they knew exactly where to go, right? They knew mm. everything where they had, where everything was located within the sh in the ship. And there's a lot of theories as to is someone uh, a traitor? And there's a lot of um, like uh, speculation going on around that. Who could it possibly be? Assuming there is one. I mean, it's just a bit of a guess, but it's, it's, I think it's heading on the right path. And this brings us back to the whole thing with Grudge. Uh, now, Grudge is obviously the cat. Yeah, no big deal. But some people have sort of put two and two together. So the reason why Grudge has got his problem with a paw, which is just mentioned briefly in the show, is there's a tracking device in the, in the, in the cat. And, uh, and so when the cat's in the ship, which is in Booker's ship, which is on the Discovery, that's where they know where the Discovery is, right? And I said, oh, you can make of that what you will. But if there's an actual spy, someone spilling the beans as to where things are, people are taking bets as to who they think it might be. You know, it's the old Siska thing from uh, Star Trek Voyager. Now, I don't know if you've thought about this already, but even during the episode, even I was thinking, oh, Booker sounding is a bit shifty. Maybe it's him. And a lot of people go, no, it can't be him. Is it Vance? Oh, it can't be him. Or is it the and Andorian dude who we haven't seen for a little while? Uh, I think his name was Rin, if my memory serves. What's happened mm -hmm. to him? Is it him? Because he, you know, he was involved with Emerald Chain. Uh, or is it uh, somebody else? And... Uh, yeah, it's uh, causing a few discussions at the moment. Because you've got to remember when Discovery was being refit in the Federation, a lot of people would have seen what was going on regarding the sport drive. So, um, yeah. Have you had a chance to think about that one at all? Well, I, I didn't really think about why uh, Grudge's paw was sore, but I thought maybe you heard it 
yep. during a, an insertion. Yep. But that makes sense to have a, a tracking device on the cat. Yep. Uh, as for who the spy might be, no, that didn't cross my mind. As for where they land on the ship exactly, once you scan a ship, you've got all the schematics. Yep. So you would know where everything is. So that's an easy sort of fit. But I look, I I don't know unless there's something more with book ship where they tried the tracking device on the cat and there's one on on his ship as well. But once you've got a signature, you should be able to find that ship within a certain range, mm. you know, and that the uh, Osiris ship didn't just appear. It sort of would have beamed into somewhere and then sort of flew. Then having the Federation um, call sign and everything, well, that was a definite ploy. As soon as they said, oh, it's a Federation ship, I went, no, it's not. It's got to yeah. be something else. Yeah. yeah. If you watch so that, obviously, the Rathacan, you've obviously, you've sort of figured that one out pretty quickly. Yep. Yeah. They, they've sort of, they've got all those sort of details and, Look, I don't know. I think, I think she may just be that switched on. You yeah. know, she seems yeah. to sort of know what's happening in the next step. How that's the case, I'm not sure yet. But um, I don't think it would be a spy because our current uh, crew don't seem to have anything shifty. Unless, and this is just a thought that came to my mind, uh, Datma. Maybe yeah. that's what, yeah. what the, yeah, maybe they've sort of plugged into her yeah. set. And they can see exactly what she sees. I, that's just a guess. Yeah, it's it's all purely pie in the sky stuff at the moment. But some people are starting to really think about it because they thought, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, it, it was it, the takeover was uh, very well done, even though it was like very simplistic. And, and a few people said, like, even with Discovery getting its recent upgrades, and as you said, the nacelles are just separated from the ship. You know why? Uh, it's like what happened to put, putting better shields in. And better, weapon, and better weapons. That yeah. obviously got missed off the uh, inventory list. And someone actually suggested, hey, wouldn't it be easier if you just put the transporter, just beam your torpedoes over to the other, other ship and just detonate them that way instead of firing the damn oh. things? I was like, oh, yeah. That's what... <laughs> Let's not worry about these little details. Oh, it'll do your head in. What can I say? <laughs> so, uh, yes, yeah, so, so they're the two stories. And, of course, it ends up like a Doctor Who classic episode cliffhanger. Uh, yeah, they've all nicked off. Uh, they've got the spore drive. Uh, I like to see, I actually, I'm very happy to see that Discovery is under some decent threat for a change. And it really is a case of what happens now. Uh, and of course, they've nicked off. And so, poor old Michael and Culver and all those guys who are you know, getting all the, the radiation disease down on the planet with the, with the dumb kid, uh, Sukal, uh, they're stuck there. So, what happens now? That's, that's a real, like, I wonder if all the writers are sitting there going, yeah, that's a great uh, ending. Um, um, what's the next episode? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, all very, very interesting stuff. Any final words on uh Sue Carl before we rate the episode, Mr. MPS? I did like when they met the hollow crowd that you mentioned before, uh, and they so it was Saru and 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 Hugh, and they met those guys who were in the holodeck with the different suits, the different uniforms. Yep. They had that max headroom sort of appearance. It was like it was thinking and it was oh, trying yeah, to, yeah, to do yeah. that. It was very, very cleverly done. It was yep. very well done. I did like that. Uh, and I think that's about it. The rest of it, uh, yeah, apart from the confusion as to why you would fly into a nebula when you know it's radioactive, you've got shuttlecraft to do that sort of thing. You've got um, sensor, sensor things shooting out that you could uh, – that's a common Star Trek mistake. Let's fly into the nebula with no idea what's wrong mm. rather than sending some sensors in there and actually assessing it. And we can just mm. sort of sit back and, and not destroy our ship and then be ready for anything. Yep. But uh, yeah, that's a, a common Star Trek theme. Um, mm. Other than that, book ship changing. Why didn't it just change straight into like a missile shape rather than... Yeah. It makes no sense whatsoever. It, it just no. hasn't been explained. It doesn't say oh, it'll go faster or it's more manoeuvrable. It's just it's doing it for the sake of doing it. And uh, if it hits something while well, it's in the middle of transition, what happens then? Does it just like lose a bit and it's like, ah, now we've got a bit of a problem. So, yeah, that's that's a little bit bizarre at the best of times. Yeah. So there you go. So uh, <laughs> how would you rate this particular episode of Federation Logos there, Mr. MPS? What do you got for us? Oh, I think you might be surprised. I'm going to give this a big four and a half logos because I really <laughs> did like the episode. Holy guacamole. Where did that come from? <laughs> oh, jeepers creepers. Well done, sir. Oh, yeah, golly, wally, wally. It's like trying to work out who the spy is. It's like, it's, it was all like, it's all very tantalizing and it's got this fantastic cliffhanger ending. Well done. Um, for myself, it was, uh, I guess, like a lot of things in this show, where it was strong, it was very strong, and where it was weak, it was very weak. And I agree with you visually, the way they did the whole holodeck thing and, and that like monster thing that, look, look, you're right, looks like it'd be filmed in water. Uh, yeah, visually, you couldn't, you couldn't absolutely beat it at all. It looked absolutely outstanding. Uh, although I did sort of wonder afterwards, like, why 
why didn't Saru just appear as a Kelpie? Considering he was dealing with the Kelpie, and I must have missed something there. It's like it was mm. a fair bit for my poor little brain to handle. So, uh, uh, unless you know the answer to that question, no. Look to why they changed altogether. I have no idea, yeah. and why they couldn't access their their bits and pieces. It's yeah. completely strange to me uh unless it has something to do with the holodeck which yeah. for some reason they mentioned the word holodeck they were there before the original series and the original series never had holodecks so yeah. how they understand holodecks unless they've learned something in the last yeah. few weeks in that three weeks uh, being yeah federation three week uh, uh, yeah thing. otherwise they shouldn't even know what a holodeck is yep totally agree so anyway um look, yeah, look visually it was outstanding uh yeah it was a bit of a brain spin and i sort of did struggle a little bit with that uh but i good to see that there was an actual decent threat towards the end of the episode with osira and you know taking over the ship and all the rest of it and be curious to see how that all pans out um so uh yeah i found after last week's which i really really loved and i really got dialed into this one sort of just confused me a little bit and of course it'll probably explain itself next week and go ah now it all makes sense but for myself i'm just going to go with three on this three federation logos because um i didn't find it as engaging uh, as last week and some of the character moments weren't as good uh as uh, last week's episode either so um but uh, that's sort of uh, where I sort of decided to go with and uh, yeah be very curious to see um, what happens next week which is very very cool but good old Sue Carl eh? so there you go so if you have a moment where you go oh look something's just jumped out at the TV imagine that you just go oh and then like hundreds of billions of people will cark it because you've just like blown up the entire galaxy <laughs> watch out for those horror movies what can I say hey eh? so there you go very good stuff well Christmas is done. We're getting close to the new year. And what better way to sort of head towards the new year than with more discovery? How good is that? So we'll have to see how this situation resolves itself. It'll probably carry through right to the last episode of the season, which is uh, kind of cool. And we'll have to see what's happening and what it's all about. So in the interim, make sure you uh, keep on trekking. And we'll, of course, we'll see you next week. Okay, take care. All the best. Bye-bye. <laughs>